Thank you. So our next speaker is Hemant Taneja. He's gen managing partner at General Catalyst. Um, he is a super underachiever. He um, not he doesn't just have one degree from MIT. He doesn't have two degrees. He actually has five degrees from MIT. So that just tells you a little bit about who we're dealing with. Um, he loves to invest in founders who have the potential to change industries, including healthcare. He has invested in Livongo, which is a company that's focused on really changing the paradigm in chronic care management, and as well as a company called Humedica, um, which was um, acquired by Optum recently. Um, in his day job, in addition to his day job, if he's not busy enough, he um, helped co-founded the Khan Lab School, which is part of um, Khan Academy's um, initial vision in terms of bringing education to children. And he's writing a book on the effect of AI in, um, in economics and entrepreneurship. So as you can see, uh, again, truly an underachiever. And um, today he's going to talk about patient-centric investing. Thank you, Sumbul, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about just how we think about investing broadly and what are the patterns we see we're seeing in other industries and, how and what we are bringing to the healthcare sector as we start to get more active in this area. So just to pick up on what Sumbul was saying, um, you know, our investment philosophy at General Catalyst has been to look for entrepreneurs that are focus on consumer experiences in major sectors. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, what Silicon Valley work used to be was around basic software uh, efficiency kinds of tools and applications, and now that paradigm is changing. So, uh, you know, with Livongo and Color in Health, or which is, uh, as examples, or Snap, or Gus, or some of these companies I'll talk about in a second, you know, it's been about entrepreneurs that think long term, they're thinking about sectors that, frankly, haven't seen a lot of innovation for a long time, and using a lot of the modern technologies to uh, rethink the, the consumer experiences. And that's why I said, I titled the talk Patient Centric Investing, because everything we look at in healthcare is very much with the focus on uh, the patient sort of in the middle. So uh, just to pop up for a second, you know, I've been in the business for about 15 years, and you know, 15 years ago, if you said somebody's going to come uh, pitch us to build an insurance company, or someone's going to uh, tell us they want to build a car company like Elon uh, did here, or you're going to hear from Adrian, who's building a very cool company in the healthcare space, I would tell you those are all nutty ideas that, frankly, can't be built with venture capital, because uh, for the one simple reason that the industries that they represent or we're trying to disrupt uh, have huge advantages around economies of scale. So when you think about, you know, six of the top companies in the world are insurance companies. They've got large balance sheets, large audiences, difficult to be a small company or to compete with them. Or if you think about building a car company, you have the amount of capital required and the large capex to build factories, a lot of that. And so, um, you know, these were the industries that frankly weren't changing for a long, long time. And over the last decade, that has uh, certainly changed. And it's changed because of um, the uh, development of a lot of platforms. So if you're an entrepreneur today and you want to start a car company, you essentially think about how am I going to find my customers online? And uh, you know, I can rent manufacturing using uh, Flextronics and other partners in overseas. That is, that's a whole part of the supply chain that's been built. Or you know, I can spin up servers using you know, Amazon and cloud, comp cloud computing. So essentially, every layer of vertical integration that used to be the advantage around economies of scale kind of becomes rentable. And, and what that's done is that these, the entrepreneurs that come today and try to disrupt these industries, they can just hyper-focus on uh, their customer and the specific product they're trying to build and use data to continuously evolve that product. Now, keep that in mind as we think about healthcare in a few minutes. Um, and uh, that advantage, I actually call economies of unscale. And that is the reason uh, you know, a lot of the change that simultaneously is occurring in a lot of different industries today is happening. Uh, some of the platforms I mentioned here, so Stripe's a local company here that we reference. You know, any uh, entrepreneur that wants to take payments anywhere in the world can just add a line of code into their website and all of a sudden their payments enabled. That process used to take months to get approval to be able to do that before. Again, sort of every bit of this kind of friction has, has uh, not gone away. So um, this transformation, when you, when, you, when you look at 
the companies around us that have been built in the last 15 years with this lens, it really is remarkable. So media has gone from you know, large studios and you know, uh, sort of artists being found by them and then being mass, mass marketed to anybody can put up YouTube videos and, and uh, uh, become personalities. I mean, the, the, the um, celebrities for our kids growing up today are very different from you know, movie stars. I mean, they, they think about all these YouTube stars that I don't even know exist, right? I mean, this is the reason because they can, uh, those artists can now reach their audiences in a very unscaled way. You know, Uber and Lyft, obviously transportation has completely been upended. I actually, uh, that's, that's one of my favorite examples because it also has this positive benefit of, uh, you know, gosh, if these companies are successful and we can also bring autonomy and electrification to this field, maybe we can someday solve a big part of climate change. I, mean, I think these are these interesting benefits coming up as we're retooling these large uh, 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 sectors. I'll talk about healthcare in a second. Energy is the same thing. You know, you can put up a solar um, uh, panels on your roof, and you can have storage, and you're you can get off the grid. I mean, that's the vision that in a few years is going to be realized. Think about that. Your your own generator of energy, of your own power plant in your home. Um, on and on and on. And lots of different examples. It's happening in giving. You name a sector, and and some entrepreneur is trying to uh, rethink the uh, experiences in that sector. Um, so I personally think today, having invested in a lot of these areas, uh, healthcare is actually the most interesting uh, sector where obviously it's close to 20% of the GDP. It's close to bankrupting us. We, we perpetually sort of complain about that problem and we have constantly struggled to do something meaningful about it. But I do think uh, we're at that inflection point where that uh, we will be able to change it. Lots of challenges. It's not a free market. A lot of complexities in being able to access. It's hard for entrepreneurs to, frankly, learn how to sell into these ecosystems. They're so complex. Um, there's lack of transparency on pricing, and consumer choice is really, you know, really not there in terms of, uh, you know, as you're going through the process. The the experience for the consumer is just highly broken. I'm sure Adrian will talk about that after this. Um, but what has happened is, you know. For those of you that are physicians in the room, for example, the expectations around what technology can do in this sector is changing just as much as you know how technology has transformed our lives in other areas. I mean, we've got an app for everything else, but we don't have for an app for our healthcare data that we can easily access, for example. And 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 you know, for physicians, certainly technology hasn't proven to be a great leverage point uh, as so far. And you uh, know, I'll cover that in a second as well. Let me give you a couple of uh, case studies of. Uh, you know, companies we've been involved in from the early stages. So if you, if you cohort consumers into healthy people where we want to focus on preemptive care, you know, uh, consumers with chronic conditions, uh, and then if you think about acute care scenarios, that's really how we look at, we bucket consumers. It's a very high level, sort of simple manifestation, but, you know, for, for chronic conditions, technology can actually play a great role. And we, we looked across uh, the various uh, chronic diseases and landing on saying, hey, let's, let's tackle diabetes first. And uh, the reason is because, you know, it's a place where the consumer already has a fairly cumbersome workflow that they have to do on a daily basis, so we're not going to be creating a lot of behavior change. Uh, you know, there's a lot of chronic conditions being tackled today, but they're difficult because people also don't want to change their behaviors. But in diabetes, is one of those diseases where you already chuck your blood sugar, you already are used to sort of, you know, carrying your strips around and and, uh, and, and have some understanding of what you should do if, if your blood sugar is uh, not at optimum le levels. And so what we did was we said, how about we create a full stack consumer experience that eliminates um, all the hassles that a consumer has to go through. So we started by first putting a team together that understands, uh, and I think that was mentioning this, truly understands the modern technology developments in consumer and then also how to go sell into the healthcare system. So from the ground up, the foundation is, uh, it, a foundational culture is to be uh, not necessarily coming from, hey, I have a Silicon Valley perspective and we're just gonna come in and disrupt everything with our Silicon Valley ways or you know, somebody who's just felt the pain so much in the healthcare system that they're only thinking about something incremental. By putting sort of interesting interdisciplinary teams together, you can do some good first principles thinking. And uh, 
We built our own glucometer that was connected. We built a cloud platform with you know, a bunch of AI and machine learning that learns from the data to understand patterns around um, uh, you know, uh, consumers and how to deal with the disease and how uh, A1C patterns move around. And then we also put a whole uh, network of care coordination teams on the back end. So we can, when, when folks end up testing their blood sugars, we can actually intervene either through machine learning and AI rules or directly with a call if it's an acute scenario. And that's, that's an experience that uh, you know, the users of this service actually love. We have tens of thousands of people that manage uh, diabetes this way on our platform within sort of two and a half, three years. It's actually one of the, for, for worries around how do you scale fast in the healthcare sector, this is one of our fastest growing companies in our portfolio of about 400 companies. Um, and. Uh, uh, and and the, the simple reason is because we literally thought about everything we did from the perspective of the end user who has to check their blood sugar and then do something about it. And, and the fact that they don't want to be reminded they have a disease, they just want to enjoy their health. I mean, the fundamental product that every one of us wants is health, not you know, sort of engagement with apps and, and that make us think about our disease all the time. And so that was sort of a key uh, design principle for us as we thought about it. Color is another example of a a company we're involved in. Uh, you know, this is a company that has created a clinical grade uh, uh, genomics test that uh, includes a cancer panel and they're actually adding uh, a lot of other uh, diseases to help you understand the, your genetic predispositions for these diseases. Now, here's a company that has taken advantage of all those platforms, as I described earlier, to completely cost disrupt. You know, if you go to Myriad and you get a test, that's 3,000 bucks. You know, this is a $249 test that can actually do a multitude of um, screens for you. And the reason is because software essentially drives their cost down to zero in terms of, you know, being able to process the sequencing. And, and all the trends are that these costs are only going to get lower and lower. So this is a company that, you know, uh, markets directly to consumers. Uh, and and through sort of clinical channel and uh, the whole idea is to start to train the the population to engage with their genetic data, have control of their genetic data, give them genetic counseling uh, for those that actually have um, predispositions to various diseases. But over time, you can see this is the beginning of how you just think about preemptive care. So if you've got you know diabetes, um, maybe there's a gut biome test you should be doing twice a year as well. And I think this is this is the kind of thing that'll happen in this sort of recurring relationship. The the analogy we use is, you know, you get a 28,000 point inspection when you go to Jiffy Lube for your car, and you know, and you do that every year. And for our bodies, we have this antiquated physical that we go do once a year, and that should really become this multi data point. Uh, engagement with your body. And, and this is how it's going to start to happen when you have a foundational understanding of uh, your bodies as a consumer. You have access to that data and you can go, uh, you know, get in this recurring habit of uh, taking advantage of these technologies. So the, the area that I'm interested in uh, these days is around uh, the EMRs themselves. I mean, it's sort of, it, it's fascinating to me that we've invested tens of billions of dollars across the providers and um, to try to make technology a true leverage point uh, inside of uh, your sort of provider ecosystems, and it really hasn't proven to be so. And some of it is because these are closed networks. Uh, the physician experiences have gone from, you know, spending more time with the patient to less, so they're actually, you know, walking with scribes behind them to help them do documentation, for example. So this is the only industry I know where they've spent tens of billions of dollars and we have become less efficient in terms of, you know, physician time and productivity. And then we're, and, you know, and they are being forced to hire humans to go behind them to handle documentation. So we're actually creating jobs. This is like the opposite of what technology does in every other sector. And so we've been sort of studying this deeply to say how, how will this structurally change? Uh, and, you know, if, if any of you have any ideas there, I'd love to uh, talk to you offline about it. I'll stop there because I think we're going to um, head into the panel um, after Adrian's talk. But uh, we'll talk a little bit later. Thank you.